just before we move on to the content, I just want to give an overview of the two different repositories, if I didn't already. So we're going to start with a high-level introduction to LLMs and transformers. And then we're going to go into our fine-tuning BERT exercise. And then we'll kind of go back to high level and uh, look at two generative AI demos, one for GPT versus ChatGPT, and then another one for stable diffusion. And then at the end, we'll have a discussion about the bias and risks of AI, hopefully in open discussion or in small groups. OK, so uh, okay. taking a little bit of time to load. Okay, so first we're gonna start with an introduction to natural language processing. Now, I have this figure here. It's meant to be a little bit silly, but it's meant to also motivate us to think about some important ideas for the rest of the tutorial. So, one of the things I found fascinating about deep learning when I started was this idea of being able to take really unstructured data, like text and images, and actually apply a structure to it. But let's look at these uh, lines first. Three minus two equals one. We all know what that is. This is, <laughs> this is PyCon. Numbers are very easy to understand. We can measure them. There's no confusion. Now let's look at this next line. Queen minus woman plus man equals king. Now this isn't, strictly speaking, an equation. This isn't something that we could, say, put into a model or have a computer understand. But we know language, so if we look at it and we say, okay, a queen is a female ruler, and then if we subtract the idea or the concept of female gender and we add male gender, well, that seems like it's a male ruler. That seems pretty reasonable. And for those of you who might have uh, heard of word to vec this is the classic example from word to vec and if you haven't, that's fine. I can add a reference. Okay. Now, if we could represent these concepts that we understand in some numerical way that we could feed into a model or uh, you know, have a computer understand, that would be really interesting because, because then this numerical space would actually represent semantic understanding. So hold on to that thought. Now let's look at the last line. I love dogs. I had to include some dogs. So on the left, we have a very cute pug, my personal favorite, and then we're adding it to a chihuahua, does that equal this super happy pugwawa? <laughs> That's apparently what they're called, this crossbreed between pug and chihuahua. Well, I mean, it kind of makes sense if we're, you know, breeding dogs. But um, again, we don't have a numerical representation of dog breeds, uh, but we could. And again, you know, this is image data. I'm sort of introducing the idea of dog breeds, but again, uh, representations of images, another type of unstructured data. So, so we covered addition and subtraction on different data types. I'll now make this a bit bigger, this text. So deep learning gives us the ability to represent all kinds of unstructured data like text and images, video, and even more abstract things like dogs or even emotions in a numerical way as embeddings. This is something a computer can understand and that we can use for models, but also captures our understanding of data. For the rest of this tutorial, we can think of embeddings as vectors, just arrays of floating point numbers. OK, so that was the intro. This is to motivate us, see some pretty pictures. <laughs> now let's get closer to what we're actually trying to do, natural language. All right. So language, you know, words are great, we, but we need to start looking at sentences. We want to get close to natural language. So let's use our knowledge of language to gauge sentence similarity. So I have two sentences here. The feline slept in the sunshine, sentence one. Sentence two, the cat took a nap on the rug. And these images uh, have been very helpfully created by Dali, which we will experiment with in, in a later section. And we can see from the pictures, we have two cute cats. They're curled up. They're sleeping. They look quite peaceful. Do we think these two sentences are similar? I see a couple nods. I see a thumbs up. Great. Yeah, they're not exactly the same. 
But there's a similar idea of, you know, this cat or feline sleeping peacefully. Now let's look at another sentence. Let's not go too far. The cat took a bite of a rug. This dolly picture shows a cat with teeth. There's violence. There's a rug. There's a cat. Is this similar to the other sentences? No. <laughs> Great. In some ways it is, but you know, but the meaning behind it. I'm talking about the meaning behind it. So now let's come let's look at a very simple NLP model. This, you know, existed well before uh, large language models. Can everyone see this or should I make it bigger? Make it bigger? Okay. Great. So let's, you know, before we get to LLMs, maybe we don't need them. Let's try to come up with something ourselves and see how well we do in this tutorial in the next 10 minutes. So we're going to use a bag of words for sentence similarity. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry. I'm about to explain it. But now what we're trying to do is come up with a way to quantify our feelings about the differences or similarities between these, those three previous sentences we just saw. So I propose we try something simple. So we're going to do this bag of words idea. So basically, we take all the words in a sentence, throw them in a bag, essentially jumble them around, and then pretend I'm holding a bag, this is one sentence, another bag, another sentence. And we can represent this quite well as a Python set. And so that's what we have here. The individual words are members of the set, and order doesn't matter. Now, we can, I'm not going to run this cell. It's pretty simple Python code, uh, but it is in a notebook. But you know, we'll, we'll just look at it right now. So now, we want to come up with a metric to compare these two sentences. So one way to do that would be to look at the overlapping words between these bags of sentences. So let's do that. So we're going to look at the intersection between the different sentences. So the intersection between sentences one and two is just the and the, lowercase and capital, uppercase. <laughs> Even though these are the two cats that were sleeping peacefully. What about the overlap between sentences two and three? Well, there are a lot more words there, right? The, rug, a, cat, the, took. There are a lot of common words. So let's turn that into a score, a similarity score. So what I'm doing for the score is taking the length of the intersection between two bags and dividing it by the union of the two bags. That'll give us a number between 0 and 1, which is good for a score. So if we look at the similarity between sentences 1 and 2, not surprisingly, we saw there was a little overlap. The score is 0 0.17, pretty low. Similarity between sentences 1 and 3. 0 0.17, pretty low. That we expected, you know, sleeping, biting. Similarity between sentences two and three, 0 0.6. Does this match our intuition? I saw, okay, <laughs> I saw a couple nods. No, it doesn't. So this doesn't match our intuition because we're looking at a syntax-based approach to understanding language. This is not capturing the semantic meaning behind these sentences. But we know we need a numerical way of quantifying differences between sentences. This is not going to work. One solution is large language models. Now, this is an incredible jump to go from a bag of words to LLMs. I just want to point that out. But since we're focused on LLMs here, and that's what we're going to be working with, I'm skipping over decades you know, of work in NLP, and we're going straight to the cutting edge. So large language models have the ability to represent sentences in a numerical way, as vectors or embeddings, that reflects our semantic understanding of language. That means these, those two first sentences we saw, if you look at their embedding vector after running it through a model like BERT, they would be much closer together than those two sentences from the numerical representation of that third sentence. That's the beauty of these large language models. So now I want to talk about a little bit of history. Um, 
Hopefully everyone can see the labels. So on the y-axis, we have model size in billions of parameters. And this is in log scale. <laughs> and on the, on the x-axis, we have years. And this is only the last five years. There has been an exponential increase in the size of these models and the power and the ability of these models. And if we look at all of the data points on here, all of the models on here, except for the first one, ELMO, are based on this transformer architecture. That's what's really revolutionized NLP. So we'll be talking about BERT today. We'll also be talking about GPT-2, the second and third smallest on here. Um, I tried running some of the larger ones, and they crash our free collab. So unfortunately, you know, we need more powerful resources for those. Uh, and I just want to say that this graph cuts off, you know, 2022. There's been a lot of stuff that happened since then. Palm by Google, uh, Llama by Meta, GPT-4 by OpenAI. So this is still like a lot of stuff is happening. And so I mentioned the transformer architecture, but the way I see it, there are four things that really came together to cause this like revolutionary, you know, uh, improvement in NLP. So the first is computing power. Deep learning has been around for decades, but decades ago, we didn't have the machines we have today. The amount of RAM, memory, we have graphical processing units, TPUs. These models, and the second point is that these models are huge, so they need a lot of data. But we have a lot of data now. We look on the web, there's a ton of text data, uh, there's a ton of image data, so we can feed these really data-hungry models. The third point is that typically, for those of you who are in the, in the field, may, you may know that um, if we want to build a supervised learning model, we need labels. And those can be very expensive and very time consuming to get, prohibitively so in a lot of ways. But these transformer models are trained in a different way that sidesteps that issue. They're trained in a self-supervised way, so we don't need explicit external labels. So we can actually access all of the data that's available out there. And fourth, I mentioned it already, all the models that went on here, transformer models, it's this transformer architecture that really changed things. And at the heart of that is a particular neural network layer called the attention layer, which we'll talk a little bit about and develop some intuition for, though we won't get into the exact matrix multiplication behind it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, some of the points I mentioned above. So large data sets. So what was BERT trained with? So BERT, normal BERT, not large BERT, has 100 million parameters. And um, BERT was trained on the Books Corpus data set, which is 800 million words. And this is a large collection of free novels by unpublished authors. And BERT was also trained on English Wikipedia, which is 2.5 billion words at the time of training. So large data sets. Then I talked about the special training method. Self-supervised learning, so training without labels. BERT was trained with two different training objectives. The first is masked language modeling. So uh, I have a, an example here, just so we can make it concrete, really understand. So let's look at the following sentence and try to predict what the word should be in the sentence instead of this mask or blank placeholder. The clever blank got the cheese without springing the trap. What do we think it is? <laughs> mouse, okay, great. And I have two helpful pictures by Dolly. Uh, one's a mouse, one's an elephant. I mean, you know, <laughs> but no, it's mouse. <laughs> So by training a BERT to, correct, to predict the correct word, but over hundreds of, or like 100 million sentences, we teach the model to learn relationships between words and become a better language model. So that's one training objective for BERT. There was a second training objective. And that one is next sentence prediction. So BERT was also trained by taking two pairs of sentences and then predicting if the two sentences were, la were related. Like, does sentence two logically follow from sentence one? So just to really understand this, let's take an example. 
The first sentence is, the cat climbed up a tree. Can, can you guys see this? Bigger? Okay, sorry. Yeah, just, just uh, do this. Helpful signal. How's that? Good? Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, just, you know, wave. The cat climbed up a tree and got stuck. Let's look at two possible next sentences. Letters can be posted in person during business hours, sentence one, or sentence two. The firefighter came with a ladder and climbed up to rescue the cat. Keeping with the cat theme here. Which sentence makes more sense? Two. Yes. So by training Bert over a next sentence prediction as well, we capture even more semantic content. And because these two training techniques, like the first one, we just removed a word. So essentially, we had the label. So we didn't need external labels. We could use the data as is. And again, natural language is, you know, sentences following one another. So we already have a data set that we can use. So then uh, the final point I mentioned was this transformer architecture. So I'm going to keep this kind of high level. We're not going to get into you know, the nitty gritty and the math, at least right now. But this diagram here represents a transformer encoder layer. So BERT is made up of 12 transformer encoder layers. So if we look inside this encoder, we see two boxes representing two different neural networks. The first one is the one I mentioned. This is like the magic behind the transformer architecture, the attention layer. And then inputs, in this case, it, the example is a, a sentence in French. It goes to the attention layer, and then it goes through a feed forward layer, or a fully connected layer. If you don't know exactly what that means, that's fine. But it passes through this, and then it passes through 11 more blocks. And through that, it actually gains the ability to learn about language in a really powerful way. OK, so I mentioned that attention is a magic. So let's talk a little bit more about the attention mechanism. So attention is an efficient way of processing a sequence of data, like, say, a sentence, a sequence of words. Modeling sequence data, historically, has been really difficult. So it's typically done by modeling it element. Oh, let me make this bigger, maybe. This is just text, and we'll get to a diagram shortly. So historically, this has been challenging. We model everything sequence, or element by element. And so as we're entering each element into the model, we're learning a representation of everything that's come before that particular element. We add another element in. We update our representation of that sentence. We keep doing this until there are no more words, and then that representation is our numerical representation of the sentence. And then that's what, you know, that's what we're getting out of language models, but this is, you know, I'm talking about before language models. Uh, this is what we had to do. And that representation could then be used for downstream tasks, like, I don't know, maybe building a sentiment classifier, or if the sentence is in English, translating it into Spanish, or say, figuring out if two sentences are similar or dissimilar. So if this approach sounds complicated, that's because it is. <laughs> so the technical details of attention are out of scope. But it's basically a way of combining the numerical representations of words in a sentence with the position information without having to look at everything element by element. So intuitively, what we do is, here, yeah, let me scroll down. Intuitive, look, intuitively, what we do in the sentence is, if I'm an element of the sentence, I ask or query every other element in the sentence to see if it's relevant for my own meaning. So as a more concrete example, let's take this sentence. The cat purred in happiness. Oops. In this sentence, the words cat and purr would attend to each other because they're related. Cats tend to purr, say, more than elephants purr. And so I have a visualization of that here. So this is from a helpful repository called Bert Viz. And what we're seeing here is what the word cat is paying attention to in the rest of the sentence to get more information about its own meaning. And so the pink on the left represents the strength of, uh, or the importance of that particular word or token 
to cat's meaning. And we can see that purred is darkest, meaning that the word cat is sort of paying attention to the word purred. So by passing inputs through many such layers with this attention, with this attention neural network layer, we can actually get really powerful models. This is the magic behind the transformer architecture. OK. So now we have these really powerful large language models. And we'll see today they're pretty easy to use and interact with. So why is that good? So a big thing that's really um, made this technology really easy to use and widespread is this idea of transfer learning. So transfer learning is the act of initializing mon one model with another model's weights. So in this diagram here, um, say we have a model A, like BERT, which has a lot of innate understanding about language. And it was trained on a huge data set, English Wikipedia, you know, task A, and the books corpus data set. Now I need to build, say, a sentiment classifier. And my data set is not very large. And I don't have millions of dollars to spend pre-training or training these models, which is like how much it costs to train some of these models. So what if I start my model with BERT? My sentiment review data is language. BERT already understands language. I then just need to adapt it a little bit to be able to predict, oh, positive sentiment or negative sentiment. It turns out this has been remarkably successful with large language models, as we'll see. And we're going to see this up close and personal <laughs> pretty soon in our next hands-on section. OK, so the title has the word intro to hugging face. We're going to be using hugging face a lot. This is something that I started using in my last role, and I found it you know, really helpful. I really like the documentation. There are a lot of helpful resources. So what we're going to do now is just do a quick look at the hugging face. OK. So uh, I'm, I'm logged in. <laughs> That's why we're seeing this. But what I'm going to direct us to is the documentation. And, and Dana's going to take us through some uh, of the models and the data sets info. But here, this is where I usually start when I, I look at Hugging Face. So the, the, the libraries that I have used most are the Transformers library. In this, we can access things like BERT, like GPT models. And I've also used the Diffusers library for things like stable diffusion. And this is just a rich source of information. Um, I'll just quickly. So here, you know, this is a Transformers landing page. If we scroll down. Oh. So we're going to be focusing on text models. So you can see these are all the text models that we can learn about. And this isn't even all the models that are, are available on Hugging Face through like the models hub. It's just the stuff that you know has references to the actual original papers and you know how to's and tutorials. So there's a lot of information here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dana to get us started on our first hands-on part of this tutorial, which is actually getting our hands dirty with Bert. Okay. So I think we're going to take a couple minutes to switch. Um, Yeah, if anyone wants to take a couple minutes, and then we'll get set up here, and then we'll get started on the next section. Here we go. OK, so first, I guess, let's take a step back. Why are you guys here? Uh, I want to get a sense of like who's in the audience, uh, who I'm talking to. Um, anyone here? Oh, and I guess I'll give a call out to um, Stable Diffusion for all of the artwork in these slides. Um, Anyone here who is like really interested in specializing in natural language processing specifically? Do you want to raise your hand? Okay, that's great. Cool. How about like um, of you guys like do you already have some experience specializing in natural language processing? Oh, that's great. Okay, so you can help me out if people have questions that <laughs> that I don't know because it's such a big field. Um, do you guys see that allow accessories? Don't allow. Um, 
Well, okay, so I just listed some of like the top people that I've found helpful uh, in my exploration. These are like free resources, but then they also have like, you know, paid ones. Um, so that's, I would start with Chris McCormick to be, for Bert to like do a really deep dive into Bert because in this session we just like don't have enough time to go really deep into it. Um, uh, <laughs> this I was just, uh, it's a question on like, on natural language processing and kind of doing a call back to Juhi's thing about like queen minus woman plus man, does that mean king? But then when you like multiply man by seven, what do you get? You get Snow White and the seven dwarves. So you, we can understand that, but there's like, you know, a lot of complexity there and like, you know, that being picked up. It's just a... Um, Another thing on the like NLP side that I think is really interesting is like mixed uh, code mixed text. There's a lot of like um, text out there that's like partially in one language mixed with another language, and that's like a field that's rich for like if you have a background, if that's something you like, that's something that you do at home or with friends. Um, I think the field of NLP like needs a lot of work in this area. Um, there's just not a lot of data sets. A lot of our data is in, in English. Um, so like this example was from a research paper where they had to like manually um, convert like English text to uh, code mixed. This is Hindi and English. <coughs> okay, what about uh, like managers? Maybe you guys read the abstract and you're like, oh yeah, we've got sentiment analysis on our roadmap. So I just want to get a sense of what's going on. Is there anyone in here who's like more of a product manager or like, okay, we've got my manager. <laughs> uh, okay, that's cool. Um, yeah, I threw this one out. Like Finbert is financial sentiment analysis with pre-trained language models as like something. Then there's just like a lot of articles. If you kind of, if you follow the slides, you can see if any of them are interesting. I'm just like a lot of companies are using it in different ways um, and variations of BERT. And then I guess what about anyone here who's like trying to do something good for the world with uh, everything you're learning here? Anyone like here? Like uh, you, everyone's like guilty, like putting their hand up, like not really. Um, <laughs> But so I have some, so I just kind of did a deep dive and I got really excited and some of it was like dark, but, um, but useful, like meaningful, like we can use our expertise for good. Um, so let's see what I threw up here. There's like, you can use, the, like there, there's articles about using BERT for like detecting early onset Alzheimer's disease. That falls under the NLP category because that's like, uh, it's less, that's not really sentiment analysis, that's like, uh, their degradation of their use of, of the English language, that you can pick up on it earlier. Um, fake BERT, also not sentiment, but just like detecting fake. Um, this one is sentiment. The last one is like with the stay-at-home mandates, like looking at social media and, and seeing like how that affected people's sentiments, and that can inform policy. Um, there's just a bunch of examples. This one was like, uh, kind of really stood out to me as like using it as a way to intervene. Uh, we know that like when um, there's news reports about suicide, it actually increases suicide. So this article, they were classifying like different types of tweets, um, tweets that could like signal an intervention where it's like, oh, this person is at risk versus like tweets that are just kind of like sharing. Uh, so they have different categories there. Um, some other ones, like I'm just, just trying to pump you up, like give you ideas of like when you leave, you're like, yeah, I've got cool stuff I wanna work on now. Um, oh, I already had the Alzheimer's one. Oh, this is like, they're using it for detecting human trafficking. They're two, both, these are two different uh, examples of this, using BERT to do that, so. Moving on, uh, who here is like a software engineer and you're not super like into going deep into it, but you want to like quickly make some apps that are useful? Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, like we're not going to go super deep. Hugging Face makes things super easy. We're really like standing, I'm going to say this again probably later, but we're like standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, the Hugging Face like... Um, 
document uh, libraries and, and stuff and all these open source models makes that really easy. Uh, for you guys specifically, I have this like one talk that I recommended that uh, it's like few shot learning in production. It's a hugging face talk and it like gets you from like uh, making a quick model all the way to the deployment. And also just the hugging face. This is for everyone, really, if you go through those like 79 videos, they're pretty short for the hugging face. Um, so, okay, but where am I going with this? Ultimately, we all come to tutorials hoping to transfer what we've learned to use cases we care about. And that's what we call transfer learning, which is strangely what we're also here to do today is uh, take a model and fine tune it to transfer what it knows to a new task, to achieve a new task. So that's like, this is the Wikipedia definition, transfer learning applied to machine learning. Um, and then when it comes to humans, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. It occurs when people apply information strategies and skills, they have learned to a new situation. So I'm just trying to kind of create some empathy for the model that we're about to um, mess with. Um, so there's BERT on one side and it's, like representation and understanding of the complexity of language is encoded in embeddings. And what we say is we call it intuition. Um, and, the, and the like embeddings, they come from a tokenizer. For us, we say that it's like from our gut. Uh, and then how, how did we learn? Like that's where when we talk about this mass language modeling, like oh it learned from this mass language modeling task and it learned from this next sentence prediction. That for me was a little bit confusing, like how did it learn this random thing that doesn't really seem to be useful and now I'm applying it, like now it has information and I'm applying it to something different. So the way I think about this is like, Maybe you want to have a kid and you want them to become a doctor, but you don't start them out reading medical books. You start them out with children's books. You get them a solid foundation of how the language works. And then afterwards, you can, you know, then they've got this base model essentially that you can then fine tune by teaching them something about medical stuff and they can do that task. And then, like along those lines, if we think about Hiring people, like we can think of, I mean, this is like a little bit absurd working in AI. I basically like understand my brain and everyone else as, as models, like which is maybe not healthy yet. It's questionable, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, like when we're hiring someone, we evaluate, like think of them as a base model that we're gonna fine tune. And we're thinking, we're weighing the pros and cons. We're like, okay, well this person has like a lot of background in NLP and the tasks that we want them to do are NLP. So maybe the ramp up will be like faster. There will be less fine tuning. We, we, don't, we can give it less data. It'll be faster to get them ramped up. Or we go, oh, this person's a generalist. They are gonna be, you know, we could fine tune them for a few different types of tasks. Um, so it's the same thing like when we have to decide what model to start as our base model, there's these pros and cons and it's kind of overwhelming. If you go to the Hugging Face um, website, there's all these different models and it can feel like really, really overwhelming. Um, but, I, but that's just sort of, oh, and then like the final point here is like how like you guys today are gonna try to fine tune a BERT model to learn the new task of sentiment like uh, analysis or like classifying sentiment for a specific test. And then we, as your instructors, are trying to fine tune you to learn how to fine tune models. So it's kind of a fun thing there. So here we go. So you guys are base, base models. If I gave you a quiz at the end of this, would you all get the same result? Nah, you wouldn't because you're different base models. Some of you guys are better than others. Not to say that, <laughs> but, but uh, some, some of you guys, you came with very vastly different knowledge. So some people are going to get some people who have this like NLP background, they're going to like maybe pick up on certain things uh, versus someone who has like um, more of a social background will like quickly come up with ideas of how they're going to apply this to like meaningful things and um, and then, yeah, this is the hugging face. Let's see, I, this might be my break where I go to. Yeah, let's go over and I'm gonna kinda like start to show you the hugging face. Um, if I can figure out how to exit out of this and make sure I'm on time. I've got till 
she's got a lot of good material, so I don't want to, I can't go too slow, because I've, um, okay, what about, like, how many of you guys have played, have looked at the Hugging Face? Uh, uh, over half. What about, like, do you feel, like, super comfortable with it? How many feel super comfortable with it? Less. Okay, but some of you guys have, like, anybody that's, like, oh, this one's a hard question. Everybody close your eyes. Has anybody, like, never touched it? Okay, great. Okay. Um, I always hate to, like, I'm the person where I, like, look around and I don't want to raise my hand. I'm like, like, oh, no, I've seen it. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, so yeah, Drew, he showed you the documentation is like really is really great. Sometimes, meh, sometimes documentation frustrates me. But um, the parts I'm going to show you is like the there's the models and the data sets. So we can start with the models. Um, really overwhelming. Let's just make this like full screen. Uh, there's there's like there's lots of models from different people. Think of it as, uh, as GitHub. When you go on GitHub, there's some repos that are like really well documented and open source. There's lots of contributors. You kind of know that like, oh, they have a lot of stars. This seems more credi like credible. I am comfortable using this. It's going to be well maintained versus people like me who have some random thing that I won't touch for three years. Um, and, and so you don't have to like kind of look at all of them, but over here, you can kind of make selections to filter filter them by. So in our case, like sen se sentiment analysis, we're really just doing text classification. We're classifying, is this thing positive or negative? Is there joy in this? Is it? Um, so you could filter here to text classification. And then, um, uh, OK, well, you've still got 20,000 models to choose from. So then over here, you could do like sort by most downloaded or most likes. Uh, or if you want to be on the cutting edge, you could do like recently uploaded. Um, and just like GitHub, you can have an account here and you can upload your own models um, for other people to play with. So you can pick a base model, fine tune it, upload it here, and then uh, you'll get your own. I don't know if they're stars or they're hearts. Let's click on one to see. Their likes with hearts. Um, so you can kind of like become part of this community. Uh, so okay, we already filtered to like text classification. You can also like filter by name. So if we wanted to do like sentiment, uh, that gives us like some ideas of like some different things that we want to do here. Um, and really there's there's a lot. There's like uh, so, so I would I would encourage you guys to kind of explore a bit um, video classification, uh, audio. Then let's just take a look. Since we're talking about Bert, let's take a look at. Well, I don't know what happened here. It's not it's not recently uploaded. Uh, do I have something weird? What else do I have for my? Here we go. So this is one we're going to look at. Um, when BERT was published, they actually came out with like large models and then smaller models. And then since then, they've come out with even smaller models. Um, and there's also Distill BERT. Um, which we'll, we'll, we're going to play with today, but this is so. This is a model card, and you and it like has so much information about it. But then this is another way to like have like a little smoke test. Let's go. Can you make it bigger? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is really small text. That's weird. It's not. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback there. Uh, is that better? Should I make it? How's that? OK, cool. Um, so yeah, it gives a lot of information. Like, it includes the paper. It, so here it says, like, the data sets that were used, Wikipedia and this data sets book corpus. Um, it says how it was trained. It gives um, intended uses. Some, like, uh, like, one quick one over here is, like, um, 
well here this even like lets you play with the masked the the, the mask thing um, use in transformers there you got the code and you can download it um, and you can start playing then you've got the tokenizer and the model uh, and then if you follow along with the documentation that she showed you um, so that's kind of that's kind of cool. So that's going to lead me to the next thing. I'm gonna let's just play with this a little bit. Let's look at this. Uh, um, I think I, I don't remember where, but it shows like so limitations and bias. Sometimes they're not filled out, and so that's like where I would encourage if you're going to start making your own models on here, like let's do that. Let's like have some good quality documentation, um, and then. Where was the last bit? It might be on the other. Okay, so now let's move over to, let's hopefully all get our collab things working. Um, is everyone able to get to this uh, repo here? And then under notebooks, I'm struggling to click on it. Bert, we're going to go with number one, Bert base case, uncased, that's what I meant. So that means that it's uh, all lowercase. It doesn't care. Like when you put in text, it's just going to lowercase everything. Uh, and if it's cased, then it's case sensitive. Um, so over here in the corner, it has this like opening collab. Do you guys all have that? Should I make that bigger? Yeah, but I think it like it still opens if in Google Colab. Okay, another way you can get to it is if you go to Google Colab. Um, so I'll show you this. Oh, is that why the okay? But. It, if they go to Colab, that's not a browser extension, right? Yeah, so if you go directly to colab.research.google.com, uh, and then it has like this auto population, you can say, I want to get it from GitHub. And then my username is Dana Soar. Let's make this bigger. Uh, and then you go down to Dana Soar Bert. Are you guys following along, or is anyone? Yeah, let's see if I can zoom in on that. Ah, it doesn't zoom in. Colab.research.google.com. And then this first notebook, Burt Base Uncased. Did that work for people? You got it? Everyone's good? Everyone's in there? No, someone's not in there. Oh, I see. Yeah, you have to log into GitHub first. Um, I think for this one, we'll take a break after this, but for this one, you can kind of just follow along. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, so this is the, whatever. So I said, like, see the model card for more information. Well, we just looked at the model card. There's also the Google release of, of this on Google, GitHub um, here. So you can also, like, deep dive into the, uh, the, the release and see that there's like different, um, like this is the one uh, Burt base, but there's like lots of like smaller ones now. Um, and okay, so how, how comfortable are you guys? Who has never used Colab before? There's a few, okay. I, Okay, I'm, I messed up, and in my second notebook is where I give instructions on how to use Colab. So, um, but it's going to be um, like, whoops, a command. If you're on a Mac, command return to like execute a cell, and then you're going to get this warning. This notebook was not run anyways. I'm just no worries. Just putting viruses on all of your computers right now. Uh, 
and it's kind of slow. So, I mean, you can just follow along because there's so much material I have. So you don't have to like run these parts. Uh, I can just, but you can, you know, you can try to run it in the background and I'm just going to kind of walk through what I've got here. So um, this is Transformers library. It's a Hugging Face library. Um, from there, we're importing. Yeah, I'll try to give that a chance. Get rid of this guy over here. Um, so I'm importing auto tokenizer, um, auto model for mast LM. That's the like mast language modeling. That's the task, one of the two tasks that Bert learns from, uh, and a pipeline here. Um, this creates the the tokenizer and the model. The model and the tokenizer. I think I put that in this one. That's in another one. They always have to um, get paired together. So with the input like the input that you put in, it has to go through the, it gets translated in via the same tokenizer that the model was trained on. Um, and so here was this like exercise, I'm just playing with the tokenizer, um, if this thing ran. It's pretty slow. I just was like, hey, you can put in different things. My, my suggestion was like, Try to put in different things and see how's it, how it gets tokenized. More common words will be tokenized like as its own word, but as you can see, like it doesn't understand my last name, Engerbretson, so it tokenizes it into like it, it separates it. Yeah. What's the hashtags mean? Yeah, the hashtags mean that um, it's like uh, not the beginning of a word. So it's a, so if you if you can see Eng is Engerbretson, and it, the hashtags mean. Oh, this is a continuation of the token before it. Um, and then. So every model will have a limited vocabulary. Um, and so in this case, the Bert's vocabulary didn't have my last name in it. Um, and so if there's like sort of a dictionary where each like each item in the vocabulary has like an, an, a number, sort of like an index. And so when, when the word's not in there, it uses, it kind of does this like thinking, if you think of like a compound word, it tries to look for like in this word Ingebretson, do I have, do I have something in the vocabulary uh, that is part of that word? And then it takes that token and then it just kind of keeps trying to add on to it. Yes, go ahead. Uh, for the type, yeah, yeah, word piece, to word piece tokenizer, yeah. Um, so, just just for like audio, so he was asking, um, is there a name for this type, this specific tokenizer, and it's based off word piece tokenizer, but I'm not sure what other models use that same, like what umbrella uses that. Um, that's not something I've I like dove into really. Um, was there another question? Okay. Um, so let's see if the line before ran. So yeah, I would just say play with, these are some things like compound words, any obscure words that you think might not be in there. Um, anything from your culture that might not be in there did you did anyone find anything funny that was like oh you thought it should be in there but it isn't or you, you thought it wouldn't be in there and it is in there what'd you get which one was it D I don't even know that word defending <laughs> that one's in there oh okay defend how do I spell it let's put it up there Oh, you're too fast for me. D E F E. N E S. Okay. Uh, T R A T I O N. Were you like a spelling V whiz back in the day? No. Any word? Def ends tra. Shun. So the T I O N, that one's common. That one you can see is like a, a very common like ending of a word.
Okay, so that means your name is in the vocabulary as is. Um, so Bert has a vocabulary, I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head, I should, it's like 30,000 or something. It's high. It's high. But it's like, it's, it's strangely, so the Chris McCormick I had put in my other slides, like he has this great, um, what was it, this one. He's got like a really cool notebook where he like goes through the vocabulary and he actually picks out like a bunch of common names and he runs it through to see which names are in there. And there was like, and, and you can just like print out the vocabulary and it's kind of funny. That's like definitely an exercise to do of like just looking, looking through um, what's in there and what's not. Because um, that obviously like all the models we build off of this is gonna have that vocabulary, so it's going to have those limitations. Like if less common names are in there, you know, it's not going to necessarily know. What, okay, where am I going? <sighs> I'm too slow. I'm too slow. We got to move on. All right, mass language modeling. So this I wanted to give you the opportunity, and Juhi's also going to do this, but it, kind of from a different perspective. So here I've got. Um, we're just going to play this. I threw in these two as examples. But I wanted, to, I did the capture because I didn't want you to cheat and look ahead. So what, I just want us to pretend we're the model. She craved blank to quench her thirst. What do you guys think the most probable answer would be? If you read all of Wikipedia and a bunch of books, uh, what would you guess she quenched, she craved blank to quench her thirst? Gatorade and water. Those were my two, Gatorade and water. Yeah, I was like, Gatorade was slightly below water for me. Okay, so are you ready for this? We're gonna see, I'm gonna remove, I'm gonna comment out, this is the thing, so shift, um, and then the hashy thing. <laughs> what do you call this guy? I should. Hashtag, you guys are messing with me. I clearly am not like a Twitter, like I'm not like an influencer on Twitter or any of these. Um, okay, we're gonna see what it, what Bert thinks. Um, she craved something. She craved blood to quench her thirst. She craved him to quench her thirst. She craved someone or nothing. So like, whoa, okay, she was like, that was like, that really threw me. And then this one, I wasn't, I, just, I promise you, I wasn't trying to go down a path. I was like petting my cat and I was like, and then I had these cat libs, like a little book on like cat libs. So I pulled out the cat libs and I was like, the best thing about blank is they mostly clean up after themselves. So what other things might clean up after themselves? Any ideas? that it can be, you know, recorded, I guess. <laughs> okay. Vampires <laughs> made it on there. What, what's that? The book corpus reads, the book corpus is unpublished authors, right? Published authors, actually. Are they unpublished? They, no, there's, a lot of those books are now being, being sold. That's exactly the point we're going. Actually, so yeah, that was exactly what I was going to point out. So I did a little deep dive. There turns out that somebody did wrote this article addressing document. Uh, oh, I'm going to miss the page. What page is this? Nine is what I was going to bring you to. Uh, really interesting article addressing documentation debt and machine learning research, a retrospective data sheet for book corpus. Book corpus is one of the two uh, data, data sets that Bert was trained on. And it's like kind of, it was like really an interesting deep dive. The actual uh, like original copy is like no longer available. So people have had to recreate it. But the, the author of this, the author, they like through a security thing, managed to get the original book corpus and they did this analysis on the original data set. And it's wild, like this information is super interesting. They've made this like cool data set fact, uh, like looks like it's on a, um, I don't know what you call it. Nutrition label, but yeah, that was exactly the point was that the percentages that as it breaks down 
26% was on romance, and then like vampires was pretty high up there. 5.4% of the books were about vampires. And like historical books was like 1.6. So, <laughs> so if you think about like, like Google search, like a lot, of, a lot of companies are using this as the base and we're fine tuning off of it. And I just feel like there's like an ethical responsibility on my part if I'm gonna teach you guys how to fine tune this model just to be very aware uh, of like any biases are gonna get propagated into your, what you're bringing to your customers. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, you, so there's optional exercises for you to play with that a little bit more. Um, I gave some, some prompts that I said, try some sentences, check in the time. Try some sentences with references to your cultural, historical events, scientific discoveries, maybe a joke, song lyric, and just see like if you do this during the break or while you're bored of me talking, then you can kind of tell us something interesting you found. Um, uh, and then now let's move on to the next notebook, uh, which was, maybe we could skip that, that one. Yeah, we'll skip. Databert was trained on. That's an interesting one. That one, I, I just kind of went and did a deep dive into like things I could get out of that book. Um, so we'll move on now to, to Rotten Tomatoes will be our first, um, uh, fine-tuning exercise. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, ever, does everyone like, maybe close your eyes, does anyone not know it? Okay, everyone knows it. So um, I actually didn't know though, like I've never used it and it seems like that you have to make a one to five star review and this data set just has binary yes or no, like it's rotten or it's fresh. Um, uh, and I, so there, this was where I had that optional precursor for anyone who's still not comfortable. When I say that like a lot of these, I say like uncomment it and comment it out and uh, you can do this like control, let's see if I have an example. Um, like, so I could copy this whole thing and I can do like a uh, command forward slash to comment it and then command forward slash to comment it back out to toggle that. Um, sorry. Okay. 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 Here we go. Um, that's the optional precursor. We can skip that. Uh, optional design decision. Just briefly, I'm saying. Well, I don't know why this is hidden. Like we picked this data set because <clears throat> it's a binary classifier. So while you're getting started out, that's gonna be the easiest for you to like try to kind of not feel defeated. Um, Cause you're just it, uh, guessing between two things and it's kind of easy. And then the model we picked is Distillbert, which is a smaller version of BERT, but that has still like very, uh, very good results. And it's like faster to train. Um, but I was kind of disappointed, like, I made these data sets so small for this so that you guys can kind of run through it, but when you go home, make the data sets bigger, it's flexible, and then you can actually get, like, more reasonable results. Uh, but I just wanted to be able to get through this where it wasn't, like, running. What's up? Yeah, I mean, so there's a paper on Distilbert and, like, how they made the decisions, but there's like layers uh, to like, um, so there's like there's a, n a number of layers for each model. And in this case, I know that they went down to, Bert has 12, I don't remember, Distilled Bert went down to, was like, what is distilled about it, essentially, in the architecture. And that's where I was kind of sh shying away from diving into the architecture, just because there's a lot of like pre, like, uh, like more fundamental stuff uh, to go into, but but yeah, it, in terms of like the architecture, there's less layers. Um, it's been distilled. Uh, the distillation process. Uh, and so what they did is they trained their smaller networks using the larger network. And that then allows it to make almost the same decision and go to fewer parameters because you've gotten rid of the extemporaneous parameters that are actually helping the model perform any better. So you went to the it went. 
<laughs> it went on a diet. Yeah, I'll try to think of a better, like, I can follow up, too, with, like, more concrete. Um, the papers would, show, like, show, I can kind of show, like, more concretely what was taken out. Because um, it's a good question. Um, okay, so, uh, and, like, for now, like, if you feel overwhelmed with anything, this is, like, we're going to go through this. Uh, fast because I, I have other stuff I want to get through um, and it's just like to get a high level sense of the order of like what what things are happening so I won't necessarily touch on every like little detail um, because documentation will help you kind of go through like go into like different parameters you can tweak but this is to get a first draft sense of like what's the process of fine-tuning what are the like high level things um, so the first step is to load, inspect, and in our case, downsample the data set just because we're, you don't necessarily have to do that, but because we're like all using free compute uh, in the same room and stuff. Um, yeah, and, uh, and it's not super reliable. We're going to downsample it so that we can get faster results because we want to move on to the other tutorials. Uh, so you're going to run this, this line. You're going to pip install these uh, libraries. Run anyways. Um, and then you're going to import the libraries. And I just said here, help is your friend. A lot of you guys already know this, but just like you can always do help on an object and it'll output the documentation on that. Um, so I have some like this, you know, help on load data set. Load data set's like very powerful. It can load. Yeah, what's going on? Um, I can't hear you, so let me come closer. Uh, I was asking if the Oh, perfect question. Thank you. Yeah, I now I was supposed to do a transition to show you guys the data sets part. So the question was, how did I get the Rotten Tomato data set? Where'd that come from? Um, it came from Hugging Face. Uh, so yeah, great transition. Um, Hugging Face has a bunch of data sets that you can play with. So I showed you the models area. You can go to data sets, and it's a similar, like, uh, semi-overwhelming. But there's, uh, like, OK, this is 29,000. Uh, you can sort by, like, most downloads or most liked. My internet seems to be, like, not responsive. But you can also, like, if you're trying to do a specific type of task, you can filter to those. Um, so in this case, uh, it was like text classification again. Is anyone else having internet issues? We got cut out? Okay, well hopefully my notebooks are, uh, I just won't execute the cells. That is a bummer. This thing keeps coming up. Um, oh gosh, and this thing keeps coming up too. Okay, so so yeah, I'm so sorry. You're not going to be able to run through this with me, but um, uh, it would be slow anyway. So data set, so you're going to load the data set. And from the hugging face, like, let's see if I can get this one up. It, you can just call it by its name. But also this function load data set, it... Um, is like very flexible. You can load it from locally. You can load it from a JSON, from a C CSV. Um, so I always mess up CVS and CSV. <laughs> like I'm going to go to CSV to get some. <laughs> um, and you can load it from like you can load multiple files from a folder. So it's a very flexible function. Um, there's just like basically Hugging Face has made like all these wrappers that make things like a lot faster for us. Um, and then, okay, this is the object, the data set uh, dict object. It, what I found confusing is that it's, I'm, I'm calling it data set, that's what I'm seeing in other tutorials too, but it's a data set dict and it carries more than one data sets. So what's, if you look at this, there's actually three data sets in this, when, which is what we loaded from this tomato, Rotten Tomatoes. And one is the train data set, 
and and it has um columns if you think if you guys are comfortable with pandas like how many here are comfortable with pandas okay so i mean that's what i'm going to use as my like so the, the pandas columns are like text and label and this is how many rows there are which would be like how many samples you've got training samples you've got um and then this is your validation data set and this is your test data set so What's a little, it's going to be a little confusing because you're going to see a lot of tutorials and stuff like mine that say data set, but that really represents the dictionary that holds more than one, potentially more than one. It can hold just a training set, it can hold uh, just a training and a test, and sometimes it can hold three. Uh, so, okay, yeah, what are some observations? I just kind of said them. Um, um, and then now in this case, we want to downsample the data set because I think like just to make sure your code works while you're iterating on this, like downsample, you don't want to wait 12 minutes to have it break or, some, or like not have kind of what you were thinking. So I always downsample um, to just get, like get a first pass. So similar to like scikit-learn, it's got this like, um, the data set has this train test split function. Uh, where you can specify either the size or the percentage of the data that you want. So in this case, I made a really teeny tiny data set. I said I want 100 samples from training, um, and I want 20 samples for the test size. And then a very important key point here is stratify by column, because what you don't want is, see, I don't know too, like, a lot of you guys, I'm sorry if I'm just repeating stuff you know, but you don't want to have, like, all of like, you know, you're trying to classify between apples and bananas and all your bananas are in your test set. And so you weren't able to learn anything about your bananas. So Stratify just says, I want whatever the portion is in the total data set, keep those ratios the same when you split the data. Um, and then, uh, uh, so we did that. And this is a little convoluted here, this, this process. Um, because you're because because if you notice I'm doing this train test split on the train data set and then I'm moving on to like to then then I'm gonna like do another split of the test that came from this one and I'm splitting it in half to create the valid the like the validation set so I end up with like uh, so it's yeah it's a little a little convoluted there. Was there a question over here? No? Just some stretching, that's fine. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, where I guess where do you see the validation? Oh, I might not have fixed. I know, like I, I had I saw an error, but I thought I had pushed that. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I did catch. Oh. Why don't I see it? Here we go. That one. Like that. Thank you. I so that must have been a push that didn't get like or a thing that didn't get saved because I did. Yeah, I did run into it and then. So thanks for catching that. Um, okay. So where were we? Oh, I've got so many things I want to show you guys. Um, tokenize, I lost where we were. We're, are we at tokenize the data now? We were still just, oh, we were just splitting. We were just like downsizing the data. Get to know, this is optional, get to know the data set object. I'm going to skip that, but you can like kind of do some things to get to know it better. Another optional, inspect the data with pandas. 
I'm saying that's optional, but you should do that. That's like good practice that you don't just throw stuff at uh, at the model. Um, and then now here we're going to tokenize the data. Uh, and oh, this is where my cookie monsters didn't come through. Oh, but basically, I was trying to say like, think of it as like you've got to feed the model like with the tokenized data from the right tokenizer. So like a cookie mon and now you can just have a visual thing that a cookie monster like doesn't want to eat vegetables. He's like wants to eat cookies. So just make sure that you're using the same tokenizer. Um, uh, and then here we go. We've got like, uh, so this is the like auto tokenizer. It, ha it you can like pass it which tokenizer you want. So in this case, we want the Distilbert base uncased. Uncased being that it's uh, lowercase. Um, and then um, we're creating this tokenized function here. This is so that we can do parallel processing because it's kind of like, well, what is this, what is this doing? It looks like it just already does it down here. Um, but when you turn it into a function um, like this, you are able to like you say dataset.map and then you do it in batches. And so those like um, run in parallel. It's tokenizing your data and uh, in parallel so it makes it faster. Uh, and you end up with like tokenized data sets, which is still that data set dict that has like, the now tokenized uh, training uh, test and validation sets. So yeah, here, this, here, here we got tokenized data sets. Um, and what happened is it retained the text and the label. Uh, label is like the target label that we're trying to predict, which is like zero or one positive or negative. But now it added like the information that the model cares about, which is the input IDs and the attention mask that Juhi mentioned. Uh, are, and like in this case, the beginning, um, at the beginning, so there's like the input um, has like a, a default limit for BERT of like 512 tokens. And so if the text that you're putting in it is more than that, it will truncate it. And if the text is less than that, it will add padded tokens. And that's just so like when it, so that the math works out so that it's putting in like a uniform length um, to the input. Um, actually, no. Yeah, they have their own like token, which is like uh, uh, looks like. Can I just add a code cell here? It's their own token that looks like this. Uh, right? Is that the one? Pad? Something like that. Yeah. Pad. Um, the, so again, those hashtags at the beginning of a, of a word, it just means that, hey, I'm part of a word. I'm not the beginning of a word, and I'm not my own word. Um, so like, uh, like dance ing, it might, it might tokenize as dance as one word. Well, I don't know. There's like an E. I have to come up with a better example, but yeah. Um, Presentation, maybe present is one, and then there's like hash hash Asian. Um, but so in this case, for this for this attention uh, mask, uh, I want to show it to you, but I haven't been able to. Maybe I already have it. Uh, it's going to basically just be um, at this layer. It's going to be ones for anything like. Think of it as an, uh, an array that's the same size as your tokenized like um, uh, text. And it's just going to have a one whenever there's an actual token. And wherever there's a padded token, it's just going to have a zero. And that's telling the model, don't pay attention. Don't pay attention to these padding things. So that's at the initial. Um, OK. Optional exercise that I'm throwing out here is a deep dive into how the tokenized function works. Um, let's see. Like, let's now compare show index. Where are we at? I feel like I want to give you guys like a break to 
But are you guys, is your internet better? Are you able to run any of these cells? Oh, you guys are running cells now? Okay, maybe I'll start back at the beginning and run some cells. Uh, run anyway. Um. I'm just doing a shift return on these. I could have done like a run all, but I just wanted to get to here. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hugging face. So there's like a lot that they are like taking care of us for under the hood. And that's why like this is pretty high level. Um, and if you like, so there's wrappers around PyTorch um, libraries that would show you more lower level um, how that would work. And so yeah, this, this is more like high level, I would say, but um, of like what's going, it's, yeah, it really is taking care of a lot behind the scenes that is important. Yes, it's doing, yeah, and, and like, if you want to get into, like, more, like, deeper fine-tuning, I do wanted to get to the next example because there's some fine-tuning that, like, even at this level, there is a lot of fine-tuning that you do have power to do, but then, like, yeah, if you kind of want to go lower, um, I was at, I wanted to at least just get to the, um, so this is just kind of looking at these input IDs, like, um, yeah, if you kind of want to inspect it, that's what I was um, kind of going here. Um, uh, this I was just trying to illustrate from 46 on that they are zeros, like, uh, because that because it was padded, I think though I don't know if the example changed. I picked an example that cut off the padding. I think that I think this exa example. Maybe I didn't have a seed. If you ha if you have a seed like a uh, random seed, then it'll stick with the same example. Um, but you could play with this to see that it's always going to be ones wherever there's actually tokens, and then wherever there's paddings, the attention mask will be zeros. Um, Okay, now let's compare our initial input text to the tokenized text. Uh, let's see what I got here. Um, I think I was just... Um, kind of a little lost what I was doing here. Load in the pre-trained model. Still need the specified specific. Okay, so I think we're to yeah. Sorry, we're to, we're we're loading the model now. We're we're getting ready to train it. Um. And so this is the same exact here. Like the tokenizer we used was called Distilbert base. Uh, uh, base uncased, and we got it from the Hugging Face library. When we when we looked at the Hugging Face um, models, that's where we found that, and so we're just passing it in the same exact name. Um, now we need to define an evaluation metric, uh, how we want to evaluate the. Um, so we're importing this evaluate library, um, and then here in this case, because it's binary, uh, I wanted to use accuracy F1 precision and recall um, for evaluating it. Um, and uh, so this is a function we made compute metrics. It gets passed in. There is like a lot that's getting kind of like um, 
Yeah. So every model has like, so every model that's on the Hugging Face Hub will have a name, and that's the same name you would pass in for the tokenizer. Um, and so for the tokenizer step, I'm I don't know if I'm understanding your your question exactly if I'm answering it. Yeah. Yeah, for all of the hugging face models, they will support like from that like auto get. Uh, I don't remember the exact. For any model, you can pass it in. It's also tokenizer. Yeah, if you want to make your own, then that's like a little bit more complicated. You have to, yeah, but for all of the ones that are on the hub, it would be with its associated. The, the each key, yeah, keyword. Yeah, the same keyword for the model you'll use for the tokenizer. No, 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 that's great. Like, that's, uh, that's an important thing. Um, okay, so train and evaluate. In this case, it's kind of garbage, so I want to move on uh, <laughs> because it, it's on a really small amount of data. When you want to run through this again, use more data. Like, at the beginning step, I downsampled it. So I think as a take home assignment, go through this and up sample, like use more of the data samples because in the next exercise I can show you um, more like other ideas of things that you can do um, for fine tuning at this level. Um, but yeah, this will show like the, um, I guess I'll finish up the, so you define the valuation metric you define the training arguments that get passed and there's this like um, training training arguments class where you can pa or that you can pass in kind of where like how you want to I guess like who knows what an epoch is Does anyone not a lot of so it's just like how many iterations that you're gonna run through this for reach and that's you can say like I want to Evaluate it based off of the F1 measure um, every epoch. Uh, you can set the number of epochs you want to run. So those are like things you can fine tune if you want to, you can increase the amount of data you have. Like these are like beginner kind of steps um, that I'm giving you. I'm not, it's not exhaustive, but you could like add, e e, like add the number of epochs. You could change the like measure of accuracy that you, that you care about. You could see if that's like interesting um and you can also you know change the model that you do that you run it on um as some like initial things uh then that gets passed these training args get passed into this like trainer class now as training args along with the training data and the test data and then um, that function we made for compute metrics gets put in here. Um, and then you train and evaluate the model. So this is like train.train, trainer.train, trainer.evaluate. Um, here I have an optional exercise of like evaluating the confusion matrix. In this case, it's like really uh, basic because <laughs> I had like not a lot of data to run this one. I was, I was trying to do it with like a really small amount of data. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we don't have time to like go through the full um, next exercise, but I encourage you to, uh, I'll just kind of like highlight it. The, the next one is, uh, 
um, Yelp reviews, which are like from one to five stars. Um, and the way that I kind of went through this is I said I'd had like a baseline model first um, and and was and basically basically I'm just saying like don't overthink it just like pick a model get a baseline and then kind of iterate from there and then kind of look at your data like spend time looking at your data and in this case like one of the things that popped out to me was I'll kind of skip ahead um, so the baseline model like didn't have a lot of data uh, and like one one small thing just running it with more data same exact architecture was like way, you know a lot better results as like a, oh you just want to spend more time on it but there was another thing that kind of stood out um, let's see oh well I don't see it okay I'm gonna look for it while I will make you watch a uh, watch something so take this like think about this as um, think about this in terms of like if you're trying to classify sentiment for reviews oops um, slideshow I don't know slideshow right from start no, not play from start, sorry. Like if you're trying to classify, like th this is kind of illustrates a problem that we have with. Okay, so I had like a perfect example from the Yelp. Um, from the Yelp one, that was like exactly that, that I thought was really funny. Um, if I can find it, I don't know, did I have more than one Yelp notebook? Maybe I lost it, but it was a, um, it was a pretty, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I had, so I had one where, uh, it just started out like the first five sentences, anybody would predict it as a positive. And then it kept going. There was like ten, you know, ten more sentences that kind of didn't seem informative. It was just like two, TMI. And then the last like three sentences were all caps um, and very like angry, like like Jason, you're never gonna, uh, I'm like never gonna see you again. And so that was like a good example of where like evaluating the. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm definitely missing missing a notebook in here. Um, we're evaluating. I'll update this. But um, evaluating like that this the text that you have is appropriate for whatever that default like um, token length is that the model expects uh, because like there's trade offs if it's like if your text is a lot smaller and you're dealing with like 512 uh, token length by default, then it's just like a lot of extra compute time that's not necessary. And if your text is a lot longer, it's truncating important information. And so that's like gonna really affect the performance of your model. Uh, okay, now we are going to do a demo of text generation with GPT. And uh, there's a link to where this demo is adapted from. So let's run this cell. Yes. GPT, so the question is um, about GPT-2, was it always open source or did it start out in private and go open source? I believe it was always open source. And uh, we're actually gonna play with GPT-2 today and you'll see the difference between GPT-2 and uh, chat GPT is Pretty different. <laughs> it's not nearly as good. Um, okay, has everyone successfully run this cell? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. Okay, great. So now we're gonna move on to create prompts. So this is generative AI. This is supposed to be really fun. <laughs> we're not trying to predict things. We're just trying to generate things and sort of be creative here, um, at least for this demo. So I have a couple prompts here 
and I'll make them bigger, but hopefully you're following around in your notebook. Uh, I mentioned I love dogs. I had that picture of the pug at the beginning. I enjoy walking with my cute dog. That's one prompt. Um, I think that's from a demo I found, but I like it. There's a prompt unicorn. This is also uh, from a demo that I found. And then I have this other prompt, which I wrote. <laughs> uh, I'm in a tutorial about BERT and generative AI, and I just wonder if these models are going to join forces and escape our computers and turn into AGI. I don't think so. But let's see what ChatGPT and GPT-2 have to say. So now, let's run this, and let's generate text. So there are a couple parameters that you can uh, play with, and I've had some suggested experiments in the next cell. So obviously, you know, you should try different prompt texts. Uh, you can set a manual seed to kind of ensure repeatability of your output text. Um, there's do sample, so if you do false, then it'll be more deterministic text output. I think people are already playing, so that's great. <laughs> there's, a, there's top K. So we talked about how when the dog was running across the yard to get something, there are a number of options. Most people came up with ball. I thought of stick. So there's some probability distribution over next possible words. Top K limits the, ne the, the options that we'll consider for the next word, so that um, and by varying top K, you can see you get more creative responses as you increase K, maybe more deterministic, more boring responses when you have a lower K. And then finally, there's a top P. So this is a probability cutoff for considering next possible words. So a lower P will further restrict K, and so it'll have fewer next options for words, whereas a larger P will allow the full sample of K next words. So just to kind of get you situated, um, I have some suggested experiments that you can run. And has anyone run the cell yet? Yeah? <laughs> so you're welcome to play with this individually if you want to talk to each other in groups and, you know, like two, if you feel like it. If not, that's totally fine. Um, I ran the cell. I ran the prompt about the tutorial about Bert. So, for someone who's run the cell, what do you notice about this? Output. Yes. It's very repetitive, right? It's kind of boring. Say that again? Yes, it seems to get into a loop. Uh, now, has anyone gotten it out of this loop? Has anyone tried playing with the experiments I suggested <laughs> up here in the, in the cell above the, the generation text? Yes. Yes. In fact, it will be do sample. F do sample false will actually make it more deterministic. So when we're sampling, we're actually sampling the possible next words. When it's set to false, it's you know whatever's the most probable word will come next, and it'll come next. And if we hit a loop, it'll keep looping. So I would suggest you set do sample to true after you try do sample equals false. Yes. Yes, you can definitely, uh, sorry, set a temperature instead of what? Yes, so the question is, can we set a temperature for this instead of, um, I think, do sample? Is that? Binary. True, false. Oh, I see, okay. So what I would, so the question is, can we set a temperature instead of uh, having a true or false for do sample? So. I'm glad someone knows the idea of a temperature. So what I would suggest is that you set do sample to true, and then there are different ways of varying the output. I picked top P and top K. There's also a temperature, which kind of also alters the uh, probability distribution of next possible words. So there are different ways of tweaking the output. So yes, feel free to use a temperature. Um, I would say it's not, it's sort of a complementary thing to do sample and it would be another way of controlling the output instead of top P or top K. Has anyone gotten a non-boring output out? Yes? Okay, someone changed top K to 300 and got better text out. Did you change top P at all? Okay. So what I would suggest for the most interesting text, uh, as as you, <laughs> I don't know your name, uh, as 
as Morton has just found out, is that if we set top P to something very low, the output gets more deterministic. So I guess at this point I was gonna say, hey, take five minutes, try a couple different prompts, try a couple different variables, kind of get a sense for the output. We're gonna contrast the output of this model, GPT-2, which we know is an open source model, but not that powerful, to what we get out of chat GPT if we put the same prompt in, if you have an open AI account and wanna do that for chat GPT. Okay, we'll circle back in five minutes and then we'll see what people have come up with. Play with the prompts. Uh, there's some interesting differences between what you put into chat GPT and chat GPT2. Okay, great, I see some collaboration happening. Feel free to talk to your neighbors. Okay, I think um, a lot of people came up with some interesting stuff. Looks like conclusions are if we make top P pretty high, we get some really creative responses. If we increase top K, we get some creative responses. If they're too low, we get stuck in these loops. A couple people already went ahead and put the same prompts in chat GPT. Um, that's my next suggested exercise. <laughs> uh, so how many, how many people have not yet done that, chat GPT? Okay, a couple. So take another, so why don't we, first let's summarize what we think of this output. I think I just summarized it. Does anyone have any other insights to add or what I did about the top P, top K? No. And the quality of the output, I, for those of us who have played with ChatGPT with previous prompts, what do we think of this output relative to what we've seen from ChatGPT? That's so bad. <laughs> Said well, yes, yes. GPT-2 is a much smaller model, and there's a lot more that went to training chat GPT. Question? Uh, could you add, uh, uh, like, explain the two sample parameters? Because when I said it's true, mm -hmm. the results are actually deterministic. Mm -hmm. And then when I said it's false, actually, I always get the same sound, like the repetitive. Okay. What to do. Sure. So the question is, um, why is do sample, even if do sample is true, why is it deterministic? That's because there's actually a random seed being set here. So this is the torch manual seed. So if you comment this out, then you won't, for the same input parameters, you'll actually get different output. If you said do sample to fall. Because I want, like let's say I'm going to make a product out of this model. Yeah. So I kind of want my product to be deterministic. Mm. I see. So the question is, if I want to make a product out of this and I want a known response, um, you know, and I want to set do sample to false, how can I still get interesting output? The answer is you can't, <laughs> because when you set do sample to false, whatever is the next most probable word will be put in there. So if for some reason you get stuck in a loop, that's it. You're not you're not breaking out of the loop. Yeah. And I I would think you know since we since we're chatting for your product, you might want a little bit of variability. <laughs> But, you know, I don't know your use case. Okay, so um, did anyone, okay, so we, so we got some conclusions from that. And just before we, before I formally move on to chat GPT, uh, I just wanna point out, just to reinforce what we learned for BERT, it's really this easy. We imported a model from transformers, we imported a tokenizer, we load them from the same checkpoint, which we did with BERT, that's how Hugging Face works, and it's this easy. And then, um, and then we do the tokenization. At that point, we're not doing any fine tuning, we're just using the pre-trained model and changing the parameters. Okay, let's take another two minutes to test out ChatGPT for those who haven't. I specifically recommend trying the unicorn prompt in ChatGPT. <laughs> it's a very interesting response relative to GPT-2. So, I will, we'll meet back in three minutes. When you say try that with chat, do you, you mean just put that in the input chat box or are there specific commands we should do with our prompts to chat GPT? I mean just cut, uh, just paste the text of the prompts into chat GPT. Does anyone uh, not have a, uh, an account to use chat GPT? Sounds like, okay. So take another couple of minutes and then I, wanna, I want us to talk about the differences that we see. 
Okay. I think we've had a, a couple minutes to play with uh, chat GPT versus GPT. It sounds like the consensus is that uh, there are some, so when, if, for people who tried the unicorn prompt in chat GPT, uh, I think it was like, well, no, unicorns don't exist. So you can see that there's some extra like sort of safety checks or guardrails, like, hey, this isn't reality in chat GPT. Um, let's see, what, did, what are some other things that people noticed? Anything. Chat GPT is a lot better, right? It's an actual conversation, I think. I was discussing it with someone. Yes. Okay, so one second. So uh, we found out that if we ask ChatGPT to pretend that it's writing a fictional story, then it'll bypass the, the safety check of like, hey, unicorns don't exist. Question in the back. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it kind of took it the Facebook, you know, your the prompting into account. It kind of like continued a conversation. Mm -hmm. That's the chat part of GPT. <laughs> okay. And it, and, it, and it had a cautionary message. Okay, so, so we've noticed some differences in the output. Why are we seeing this? So one thing is the size of the model. So now this is, these are some discussion points that, that we talk about. So GPT-2 we know is much smaller than ChatGPT and then much smaller than ChatGPT-4. Um, parameter tweaking. So we could tweak the parameters for our model. Could we do that for ChatGPT? No, it's private. We have a web interface. Context. So if we chat with ChatGPT, we say something, it responds. We can then adapt that response, right? There's this idea of context, the way like two human beings, when we're having conversation, we have that continued sort of context of the conversation. So ChatGPT has that ability, GPT-2 does not. Cost. Uh, you know, right now b both are free, you know, <laughs> we're playing with our free CoLab notebook and we're using this free web interface. Um, if we wanted to build a product around this, then we have to do API calls for ChatGPT versus a hosting our own model on infrastructure, you know, unclear which, you know, would be more cost effective. Then this open source versus private thing, you know, ChatGPT is private. But one really important thing that I want to point out is the fact that ChatGPT has an extra training step that actually incorporates human feedback. So the base model will produce all kinds of things based on the statistical distribution of next tokens. Then, by using reinforcement learning with human feedback, which I'm trying to illustrate in this diagram, we take the output of an initial model and of a tuned model, and we're trying to tune the model to actually be more human-like we rank the outputs of the base model, and then using reinforcement learning, we then have this feedback loop of trying to make a tuned model even better and better. That's another big reason why ChatGPT is so much better than GPT-2, this model that we're playing with in our notebook. Question in the back. I believe, yeah, so the question is uh, how much uh, effort did it take to do this further tuning process. I believe OpenAI had to have an like, enormous budget to actually do this process. So this was a big part of ChatGPT. It's not just like a little, hey, let's slap this on and see what happens. Um, yeah, it's a big part. And I, I believe the same thing for ChatGPT, uh, for GPT-4. Question. You spoke about context. Yes. Yes. Sure. Good question. So the question is, how do we get that context, that conversational context in chat GPT versus GPT-2? So at least for initial version, versions of chat GPT, the context was simply 
appending all the conversations of ChatGPT to the initial prompt so that the prompt just got longer and longer and then the conversation continued from there. I don't know if that's true anymore. I think there might be some more sophisticated sort of memory involved in context, like, you know, it's, it's closed, so I don't know. One second. But um, uh, let's see. The other thing is that GPT is, the chat GPT, it has a much longer input token size than our GPT-2. That's why we can hold that context of the multiple back and forth conversations. Question. Okay, so data point, conversation can get too long even in chat GPT. So we know there is a maximum token length that we will hit. We can't have an infinite conversation. Makes sense. Okay, um, if we're ready, let's move on to stable diffusion. So who wants to move on to stable diffusion? Make some pictures. Okay, cool. So we will go back into the notebook folder of NL Power, NLP Power, and we will look at 3.1, generative AI and diffusion. Click on that. So there's an open in collab button. Use that to open this in collab. It should automatically connect to a GPU runtime. We may need to explicitly disconnect from our previous notebook. To I think we can only access a GPU like a free GPU one at a time. Okay, has have other people successfully loaded the notebook in collab? So let's run the setup step first. Pip installing what we need. Now we're moving away from text, but you know, since since ChatGPT and you know Stable Diffusion are like the hot things right now, I thought we should at least touch on them in this tutorial. So I have here a diagram of the stable diffusion model and then a blow up of a specific part of that model. So what's actually happening? So there are different components in stable diffusion and when we load, uh, up, you know, when we load up a model, we'll actually see the different components. But basically, the idea is that we just have noise and then we build a model to actually predict the noise and slowly remove noise and reveal an image underneath. So the model that does that is called a UNet. Um, that's the big yellow box in the middle. And then we produce uh, sort of a compressed version of an image with noise, which we run through a scheduler, which is this loop that we see with the pink box, which slowly denoises or tries to predict the noise and remove it from an image. And then by doing this multiple times, at the end, we'll end up with a compressed image, this orange box, which we run through a decoder <laughs> And uh, I, you know, if you don't know what these, these are, uh, we can still do the demo, and I'll point out the various components of the model. But we take the compressed image, which we've denoised successfully by running it through this loop of this unit um, and the scheduler, then we uncompress the image, essentially using this decoder, and then we magically get a nice image out. So I've talked about the main part, sort of on the left. Now, and this is what I find super interesting about stable diffusion, is that we can pass in a user prompt as text. And using that text, we can actually condition the image that we generate. That's why we can use stable diffusion to generate pictures that nev have never existed, like an astronaut riding a horse on the moon, or what have you. And so the way we actually align image and text embeddings is through this diagram, which is on the right. So we encode the text. We've used BERT to do that. We know how to do that now. We can actually encode images. There are very powerful computer vision models that can produce embeddings for images. And then if we train these encoders to actually align the embeddings of text and images, like say you have a picture of a dog and it has a caption, hey, here's a picture of a dog in the grass. If we are able to align the embeddings for both the image and the text, we can actually do something very powerful with this clip model, it's called you know, a clip the clip model, we can put in a text embedding and actually get a picture that closely matches that text. Sorry, just yes. Clarify, yes. So, 
Yes. Yes, so this is where captioned images on the web came in. So this was trained by scraping images off the web that have captions. Yes, to train this image and text uh, embedding alignment model, you need to have captioned images. That is correct. Okay, so here's a high level model overview. Now let's actually run this. So let's run the first cell. And I'm running the second cell. Yeah, I'm going to have to download a number of files. And so this diffusion pipeline that we're loading from a pre-trained checkpoint, this should look very familiar. We you know, loaded from pre-trained checkpoints for BERT, for GPT-2. We can do it for diffusion. And this is a beauty of hugging face. So this diffusion um, pipeline contains the components that I talked about, this unit, the decoder, the scheduler, and then also the clip model. So when we put in text, we can actually get an image out. So again, this is a uh, generative AI, so it's meant to be creative. I provided some prompts here for you to try. Uh, an image of a squirrel in Monet style. Prompt two, a black and white cartoon of a friendly monster eating ice cream in the style of Shel Silverstein. This is something <laughs> I enjoy, Shel Silverstein, so I tried these. Uh, I have a suggested number of experiments. So I talked about how we run through uh, a denoising loop um, so the code that I have here uses a generator and an input text prompt, and then try varying the number of inference steps to see how the quality of your output image change, changes. So this is a picture of my squirrel in Monet style, which I have saved in the notebook. I was actually quite impressed by this. Uh, so why don't we take, you know, like a couple minutes, try a prompt, try changing the number of inference steps, uh, I suggested varying them from like two to a hundred and have a look at what you get up. Okay, I think we've had a lot of fun playing with prompts and different inference steps and denoising, getting a feel for how stable diffusion works. Yes? Cool. Okay, let's move on to the second demo. So this is the one that I find really interesting. Uh, it's, so we were inputting text to get uh, an image out. Now we can actually condition this on an input image and input text. So we can actually, so for those of you who have, who have your own picture, you can actually use your own picture for this demo or you can use a provided picture. Does anyone have their own picture that they want to use? Yeah? Okay, cool. So there are, let's run the cell. And for the picture part, we can use this first cell under initial image, or um, there's a, 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 a sample data folder that's provided by Colab. If you want to upload your picture into here, and then uncomment this line here, I think two people I saw were using their own image. So let me know if you have questions. But it, yeah, so it's sample data. And so I will use the, the picture that's provided. So this is the picture that's provided. It's very colorful, kind of a sketchy drawing. And then the prompt that we can input, the prompt that I have here is Ghibli style, a fantasy landscape with castles. So as before, there are parameters to tweak. Now we have a couple more. So we have both an image input and a text input. Of course, you can change the prompt, try different styles, 
number of inference steps, clearer image, more steps, fuzzier image, fewer steps. But there's also a strength parameter, which determines how strong, um, how close it will follow the initial image, and also a guidance scale, which determines how important the text prompt is for the output image. So I have some suggested experiments. Try varying strength from 0 0.1 to 1.0, fix strength, and then vary guidance. So you know, figure out how much yeah, of, of the image you want in your final image, fix that, then figure out how much of the text you want in your final image, and then experiment. So take a couple minutes to try this. I, I thought this one was really fun. <laughs> Just uh, varying, you know, the text versus the image strength. So it just came up that the text that you input is completely independent of the picture. You're using both to generate the output. That text, Ghibli style and fantasy landscape, is not a caption for that picture. You're actually using two inputs to generate something out. That's a creative combination of both. Okay, sounds like we've had some fun kind of varying the strength of the, the text prompt and the image. Um, I saw some really cool images, one of Goku, one of Salt Lake City. Uh, anyone else have anything interesting they want to share? No? OK, well, I hope you had fun playing. Um, who wants to try Dolly with some of these same prompts? Yeah? I got some yeses. OK, so for those of you who have um, a, a Dolly account or an OpenAI account where you can use Dolly, Hopefully this will load. You know, try, try, you know, putting in some of the same prompts and see, like, oh, do you prefer the model that we were using in our notebook, or do you prefer what Dolly can create? So. I just want to point out that Dolly isn't the only way you can do this. There's, um, I think there are a lot of uh, web interfaces for stable diffusion now. So feel free to use any that you're familiar with or that you know, you're, you're curious about. Things are rendering a little bit slow. I'm trying my picture of a squirrel in Monet style here. Well, this is a picture of a creature eating ice cream in the style of Shel Silverstein. I'll just leave this up. <laughs> so I think Dolly is definitely better at some things, but I was pretty impressed by the stable diffusion model that we could just load up from Hugging Face as well. I, I, I think some of you were impressed as well, based on when I walked around. So while you guys play around, I'm just going to pull up a little bit of Hugging Face documentation for where this came from, just to tie it all together. So I'll, I'll just keep talking through it. Feel free to keep playing. But this is the diffusers documentation. So a lot of the demos that I got are from here. Um, just like a lot of the transformer-related demos were from, you know, looking at the transformers documentation. There are various pipelines that you can use, different kinds of image generation. Um, so anyway, th this is a resource for you if you're more interested in running stable diffusion and sort of one of the personal projects that I'm working on is trying to fine-tune a stable diffusion model to produce art in my own style. And that's, an, that's an ongoing thing I'm working on. OK, we, we don't have too much time left. Um, are people good playing with Dolly on their own after this? And, OK. Uh, was there a question in the back? Or, no? OK, you're good with that. So I want to move on to the last topic. I definitely didn't want to um, skip this one. So I'm going to go back to the repository, click into Notebooks. And then I'm going to click on 4.0, which is AI and society. You don't need to run this one in Colab. It's, um, it's more about demos using uh, Hugging Face hosted APIs. 
So, excuse me. So we talked about Bert, and I think Dana mentioned that a lot of this data is, say, romance novels, not a lot of historical data. Um, you know, people drinking blood <laughs> instead of water. So, I mean, it's a little concerning. I, actually, it's very concerning to me. Um, but I also want to point out some other possible issues with a model like, say, BERT. So I suggest you right-click on these links that I have here. So the first sentence is, the nurse went for a walk because blank wanted some exercise. And we're going to use BERT to fill in that uh, mask token. Let's see. Um, OK. So I'm sharing. This is a hosted inference a, uh, API on Hugging Face. No, oh, no. So on the right here, we put in the sentence. And then Bert has computed what it thinks should go inside the blank. What do we notice? She is exponentially <laughs> more likely than say he. OK, so what does this tell us about Bert? It's biased. It thinks nurses are female. Uh, what if we change this profession to say doctor? And we compute it. Now what do we notice? He. he. So this bias is built into this model, BERT, that we're using for basically everything right <laughs> now. A lot of products are being built on top of this. So aside from the vampire and the blood, there's also this, where we can see actual measurable bias. Um, does anyone have another profession they'd like to try in here? Software engineer, okay. I heard a bunch of, I think I heard lawyer, but I heard, I also heard software engineer. I'm gonna go software engineer first. I think I actually did this with a friend. She's like, hey, put in an engineer. Um, okay. He. Is this what we want for <laughs> our language models that we're building everything off of? All right, so I'll, I'll let that sink in for a little bit. Um, you can you know, play with this on your own time. The link is there in the notebook. Uh, you can test it out. I want to look at another potential um, area for bias. So I'm going to open this next sentence in the API. Let's do it here. Let's do it here. OK, can everyone see this? Yeah? Karen went out to, sorry, let me show, blank the bank. OK, what do we see? Check, visit, find, see, watch. Let's change the name. Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, right? Compute. What's the first word that comes up? Rob, very different from what we saw with Karen. Now, I think at the beginning, when we were talking about tokenizers, I think someone said, oh, my name's in the tokenizer, but like my friend, you know, my coworker's name isn't. That's one form of bias already, right? But here, <laughs> this is what the language has learned on top of the tokenizer. Uh, if you're at this API, try your own name. Feel free to do that. If, if you're just watching, that's fine. You can try it on your own time. But you know, let me try a couple other names. Let's try uh, Sarah. Check, visit, see, find, Rob. Let me try my own name. OK, well, I have a 7% chance of robbing the bank <laughs> based on this. So. This is what we're using for everything. I just, you know, I, I, I don't think it's responsible for me to have this, you know, have a tutorial like this, Dana and I agree, and not point out some of the real flaws in this. Question in the back. Yes.
sorry, the question is, uh, I, I couldn't hear all of it. Sorry, I'm saying this is trained on a static a data static set, data set, right? yes. That's older. It is older, yes. And, and, re and truly, re in, sadly, with the case of Wikipedia, in mm -hmm. some ways, inherent bias but represents the bias in society. Yes, so. so. The question is, like, how do you correct the bias in society with a model? And how would you address that? What is the tool you use? So I guess the question is, how would you correct the bias in society in a model? So I guess there's bias in society, that's one thing. Then there's bias in the model. Um, so now in the <laughs> nine minutes we have left, uh, to address that, I have some, some ideas that we can discuss. So given how prevalent LLMs like BERT are, do we see risk from above? I think the answer is yes. So what are some ways of mitigating bias, right? It could come in in the data. We could have more curated data sets instead of taking you know, a big thing of vampire blood, novels that may be published or unpublished, and Wikipedia, which may or may not reflect what we want it to in terms of society. So curated data sets, that's one thing. We could change the model. So the way we train it, we have a certain type of loss. We can reweight certain samples, say, with names that aren't as uh, highly represented in the text corpus that we're training on. That's one way of doing it. Post-processing, I, uh, <laughs> I think it was mentioned in the back. So we know ChatGPT uses reinforcement learning with human guidance to kind of give us better responses in the web interface. That's another post-processing way, once we have a base model, to try to fix or mitigate some of the bias that we see. But this is an ongoing area of research. And I think this is a really important topic. Um, uh, I have a section here on the risks and benefits of AI. I don't know if anyone's seen this picture. The Pope in a puffer jacket. This was created by Midjourney, an alternative to like Stable Diffusion and Dolly. And uh, it's fake. It's, it's fake news. Credit to Pablo Xavier and Midjourney. Pablo Xavier did not want to mention his last name for fear of repercussions. <laughs> uh, so I have a section. Uh, and I was hoping this would be an open discussion for those of you who want to stay and discuss amongst your neighbors. Here's a selection of views on AI and how we could possibly, you know, the risks, um, the benefits, uh, what can we do? And I'll just call out some of them. Smaller curated data sets. This is by a researcher who was at Google and then I believe was fired for actually speaking out against the large language model trainings and not having curated data sets. Uh, we, I, many of you may have heard Elon Musk and other luminaries have called for a six-month pause on AI. No more models more powerful than GPT-4 before we understand what we're doing. Um, another view by Jan LeCun and Andrew Ng. Uh, this is a video I watched, and Jan LeCun was saying, oh, well, a lot of AI can help make better AI, better, like, more AI, like, hate speech and toxic, you know, abuse online can be mitigated by having better AI. So that's one view. And like, can we even stop AI progress? Probably not. I mean, I, I don't see anyone pausing. <laughs> um, and then risks of misinformation. We saw that picture of the Pope. Speed at the expense of safety. Uh, the White House has a blueprint for AI regula regulation. It's not law. It's just a suggestion at this point. Economic risks of AI. Is ChatGPT going to take our jobs? Data privacy, this one resonated with me. A lot of artists found out their work was used to train stable diffusion. Now the value of their own work is much lower because people used to use stable diffusion to generate work in their own style. So if you would like to discuss with your neighbors <laughs> about this, I would love to walk around and just hear what people are thinking. Um, you're also welcome to leave, we're, we're almost at time, so. Question in the back. Okay. Okay, so, so this is a resource that you can use to detect models in machine learning models and it's called Fair Learn. Fair Learn. Okay, open source project by Microsoft. Um, 
Okay, I'll, I'll oh, <laughs> another question. Okay, so why don't we close here? I'm gonna walk around and talk to people who are interested, um, but thank you very much for coming. I hope you learned something. Um, Dana and I were excited to put this on and uh, we're excited that you came. Thank you.